Hey, Merry Christmas, my friends. It's the day before Christmas. All is quiet on the job site, and I thought this would be a great day to kind of give you an update over here at my real remodel project. Now, if you're not familiar with this, this is a 1970s house in the same neighborhood as my current house. We're doing a whole house remodel over here, and I'm at the point in the, in the job where I've done so much work and I'm about to do a lot more work where I need to really question, should I have just demoed this and started new? You know, my friend Matt Carricker over on Renovation Ranch, he's facing the same questions on his house with the amount of work that he's doing. And we got a ton going on here. So let's dive into a little bit of that today. Cause you know, that is a question I get all the time in my 25 years of building and remodeling. Should we demo it? Should we renovate it? What are the pros and cons of each? So we're gonna spend a little time on that and I'll give you a little update. Let's get going. Okay, y'all, so if you're new to this project, this is a 1970s house that I originally intended to put like 50 to maybe $75,000 into, do a lightish remodel, but the more I got into it, the more I realized, you know, the house was in terrible shape. All kinds of massive pests and rodents or raccoons, uh, just really poor quality, everything behind the walls. And I'll be honest, when I originally was thinking about this property, which was my neighbor's house for many years, I had originally thought, well, maybe I'll do a whole house remodel or maybe I'll just demo it and start fresh. Now we ended up doing a remodel, but things have grown tremendously as you can see. Now the front facade was brick. You can see the brick leg uh, right there, lug right there, which is basically a, a lowered section in the formwork that allows you to put brick on and there's a little bit of a jog in the foundation there. It's usually a two by six place in the formwork that allows that. Behind that, they use thermoply sheathing. Unfortunately, a really bad cardboard based sheathing. You can see, I mean, look how this window is installed here and yet no problems because it had a two foot overhang. Now what's going on with the overhang? You'll notice the overhang's gone. We are doing what's called a chainsaw retrofit to this house, which means that we're basically gonna saw off all of these overhangs on the house. We haven't done it quite here yet. And then after we saw them off, that allows us to run new sheathing, uh, do a really good job of air tightness, and also insulate on the exterior of the house. And we're gonna do exterior insulation on the walls and the roof line. So stay tuned for that, that's coming in the future. But let me show you what's going on on the inside. Now the house had multiple levels, unfortunately. When you walked inside, there was a, there, this is basically where the front door used to be. There was about a six inch step when you walked in. And then this elevated slab over here was the dining room. And we're gonna be changing the way the house lays out. I'll lace in the plan so you can see that. But basically you used to walk in and there was a staircase right here. That's what that, big void to the upstairs is. And, and then the upstairs was a three bedroom, one bath up there. Now, as we've decided to kind of turn this into my house and not a rental house, um, we wanted to add some space up there. Now you can see we're, we're framed with trusses right here, but I wanted to add to the second floor. So what we're gonna do is actually extend this floor line here and bring it this way by six feet. Now these trusses are on two foot center. So you can see that's two foot there, four foot, six foot. And where that temporary two by four is coming down there, you can see we've dug a, a big hole. My engineer has specified a footer right there and we're gonna put a steel beam there. And then where those trusses end for the floor, you can see we just have a temporary su support there. Uh, in the next couple days, we're gonna be adding steel beam across there to support that. And then this wall is going to get framed out. This, this roof line is going to go away. Uh, we're going to extend the uh, upstairs roof, second floor. And basically we're going to add six feet to the whole upstairs of the house, which allows me to have a bigger bedroom up here for my daughter. And then in this space here that goes away, there's going to be a full bathroom up there. Pretty sweet. Now in this section back here is where the kitchen used to be. Uh, we found massive uh, rat action back here but where that plumbing is coming out right there, that's basically where the, um, uh, where the kind of peninsula sink was before in that space. 
And what we're gonna end up doing is moving the kitchen around a little bit so that I can, instead of having a slider in a breakfast room, that area back there, which was originally laundry room, is gonna end up becoming um, pantry space back here. This door will go away. We'll have a nice uh, laundry space in here. Water heater is gonna go into the garage and we're probably gonna do a heat pump water heater. And then this wall separating the garage from the house is actually gonna move inward a little bit so that we can actually gain a little bit of space in the kitchen and I'll lose just a little from this two car garage. But what I'm gonna gain back is in the old house, the um, upflow furnace was in the garage. Now that is a terrible place for a furnace because what lives in your garage? Your cars live in here. You got all kinds of nasty fumes and chemicals and the return is on the bottom side of this thing. You can see there's actually a, a, a sleeve they put in from the outside that ran the conduit for the uh, Freon lines. But basically under here was the return and look at all the rat droppings and all the nastiness in the return space underneath the furnace. So when the furnace was kicking on, all that stuff that looks like M&Ms in there, that is not, that is rat droppings. Totally disgusting. And the other issue with putting these in your garage is your garage is unconditioned space, which means that you've got cold air and cold air that when it hits hot humid air and basically cools these duct down, it means that we've got massive amounts of mold that are gonna grow on these surfaces. So look at all this. I mean, the, the sheetrock underneath this thing was just covered in mold. And the backside, the same way. Let's see if I can slide through the studs here. Show you that. Look at all that. I mean, just massive mold. Just totally disgusting back here. Okay, the other problem with that though is we've got ducts now going out of the condition space. Slide back through here. So all these ducts here that were in the ceiling of the garage, how do you insulate those properly? And oh, by the way, look at all that damage on that duct in particular right there from raccoons or rats, I'm not sure which. But if you look at these ducts closely, see that right there? You know what that is? That's probably urine from some animal. You can almost see the droplets right there. So we will not be doing any duct work out of the garage space whatsoever. Now the garage does present a special problem for me as a builder because on the front of the house here, I wanted to change the facade and make it a little more friendly towards the street. And above the garage before, we had no windows whatsoever up in this bedroom facing front. Not a very friendly facade. So Kit Johnson, the architect, did a great job of lowering this roof. We're gonna lower the pitch on this roof, add some windows up there. But when we lower that pitch, Look what that means. I've got a girder truss up there, which is carrying the load. See that right there, that triple uh, truss right there? That triple truss is carrying the load from the garage and bringing that load over to these side walls. So it's bearing down on that triple stud right there and then on that triple stud right there. And we're gonna remove that. So we're gonna have to work on the engineering because the roof pitch is gonna change. Probably gonna get rid of these trusses and go with standard two by eight rafters. And then on the front of the house, we just started bracing up. We guys need to come back actually today and do some more bracing. But we're gonna extend this roof line all the way across here and make a front porch area, which is gonna be fantastic. I'm super excited about that. That means I'll have nice cover for my front door area. Things are gonna work real well with that covering. Uh, let's see, let's go around back real fast. I'm gonna show you just a couple things in the back side of the house so you can get a good gauge for what's happening there. And we'll come back and show you a little more when the demo is a little easier to understand. Steel's coming here in the next day or two. The guys demoed out my fireplace footings, which were right here. I had a bunch of concrete, that's all gone. I'm super excited to get all the siding off and resheathe with some Huber Zip sheathing. It's gonna make a big difference on the energy efficiency on this house. And stay tuned for a future video. Over here, we did a, um, a mock-up of a couple different ways to install windows with some exterior insulation. But we're gonna end up using basically Huber's zip system on the whole outside of the house for air tightness and waterproofing. And then we're gonna insulate on the outside of that. And I'll give you just a quick preview of that chainsaw retrofit. This is a little more 
easily understandable here. You can see we've sawn off, we've sawed off the rafter tails here. We'll put exterior insulation on the walls and that'll carry onto the roof line, which also means my air tightness can go from the foundation all the way to the peak of the roof. I can basically tape that entire house. And then, remember me saying overhangs are good for the house. After we insulate, then we'll add the overhangs. They'll basically get lag bolted onto the house. So when it's all done, you won't tell that we've got exterior insulation uh, on both the walls and the roof line because it'll look like a normal house again. All right, now that we've gotten the tour, you can see we've got a serious amount of work here. This is beyond just a normal remodel. And, you know, as a contractor over the years, when I started uh, my own company almost 15 years ago, I did all kinds of remodeling. I would do kitchen remodels, smaller projects. Uh, of course, everyone, everyone has to. But as I've gotten uh, in business longer and developed more of a reputation, I've found that I have a hard time leaving things well enough alone. You know, the, one of the issues that, that uh, I came across all the time was, look, you're doing a kitchen remodel. The ducting's not in great shape, but that's not on the scope or the furnace that serves that area is 20 years old, but it's not really in scope to change it. I hated covering things up again. that weren't really to my standards. So as we talk about this question of remodel versus new, it's really a hard question. And I'm a little biased because as a company, my remodeling company or my building company has really said, look, we're not gonna do the project unless it's a whole house remodel and unless you're gonna move out uh, so we can really do it right. But let me run through a little bit of this uh, remodel pros and cons and new construction pros and cons with thinking about this house in particular. Um, and if you've got a similar house, that's in you know similar shape. So what are the pros to remodeling, which is what I'm doing here versus tearing it down and building new? I think one of the biggest pros that I talk about all the time with my clients is limits constraints. Constraints are good for us. You know, the constraint of being married to one man or one woman means that you're not going around with other people and trying to have multiple relationships. That constraint of marriage is a good thing for us as a society and for us individually. Constraints on a remodel sometimes mean, you know, we can't add a lot to the footprint. This house, I'm adding a little bit upstairs, but the whole first floor, I'm basically keeping the same. Um, the other thing that kind of goes along with that is that, uh, you know, a lot of times a remodel has much, much easier permitting and HOA approvals, and that's the case here. I've got some really big trees in this property. Uh, in the city of Austin, where I build, there's a lot of regulations uh, in general, but also around trees. So building new would have been very tough for me. Uh, there would have been a, a lot more permitting, a lot more planning, just a lot more money involved just to get to the starting point. So remodeling really makes it a lot, a lot easier. And I also like the constraint of having a uh, kind of a general footprint. You know, if I would have torn this down and built new, um, I would have probably done another thousand square feet here and my budget would have been absolutely strained. Everyone's would. So building smaller and being constrained with what you've got is a good thing. So this is about a 2,500 square foot house, 2,400 uh, before the remodel. I'm adding about 400 square feet or so. So we're going to be 27, 2,800 square feet, something like that. For my family of six, that's great. That's perfect. That's plenty of room for me. Had I built new, it would have been easy for me to design a plan and say, hey, we're only going to build 3,300 square feet. But by the time I got my wish list, my shopping cart full of all the things that I'd like to have, it, this happens all the time. The house is, you know, 4,000 plus square feet in a four car garage and that just adds up. So remodeling is really good. The other thing I like about remodeling and the pros is that a house is going to fit into the neighborhood way better uh, on a uh, remodel compared to building new. And like I said, I like doing the whole house remodel. It means that even though this is a remodel, in effect, I'll get a new house here because I've taken it down to the studs and I've really done it right. So I've, I think in this case, I've made the right decision. But what are the cons? I mean, as you can see, this is a ton of work. When you're building it, when you're remodeling, I always say you're building a house, but there's a house in the way and everything's more expensive. You know, the framing's more expensive. Uh, just about everything we do has a problem that needs to be solved first. And with that, um, there's more cost unknowns, right? It's really hard to budget for this. 
Now, I started out with way too low of a budget and way too low of expectations, but luckily I have the means, or not luckily, I'm blessed to have the means uh, to be able to do a more expensive project. Not everyone is. Um, so that is certainly a con for remodeling, that if you run across problems or issues, will you have the budget money to do that? The other con, I think, for, for remodeling is what I talked about earlier, where you're tempted to leave well enough alone. Uh, you know, I talked about a 20-year-old HVAC system, but what if you have a 10-year-old HVAC system that's, uh, I hate this term, but that's builder grade. Oh, builder grade's the worst. It's the cheapest uh, legal whatever that you can install. I hate builder grade. It's usually not very well built to begin with. And if you've got a 10-year-old builder grade whatever, you may be tempted just to leave well enough alone because it doesn't make financial sense to, to pull it and put a good one in. The other thing uh, that's a con on remodels is when you're budgeting, um, even on whole house remodels, I budget at least a 10 to 20% contingency on a remodel for a client. Now again, this is my personal job, uh, a little bit different going on here than if, that if this was a client job. So all that added up means that for another person, for another contractor, for you, maybe it actually is better to scrape this house and start fresh. When you build new and you've demoed it and started fresh, you get what you really want. There's no constraints. Um, you can start fresh. Uh, there's no old work to work around. Budgets can be much more nailed down. I can give a set of fresh plans to an electrician, to a plumber, to a trim carpenter, to a cabinet maker, uh, to a concrete guy, and he knows exactly what's going on. There's no unknowns there. I typically budget contingencies like three to 5% on new construction jobs because there's still some unknowns, right? Not everything's perfectly nailed down. Plus we have the issue of what if one trade's not available or somebody goes out of business who bid it, whatever. You need to have some contingency money in there. The other thing that I haven't mentioned yet on this house, but um, another big reason why I went remodel versus new is um, this house has good bones. And, and that's a phrase that gets used way too much, but what does that mean? It means the foundation, number one, was in good shape. Uh, I'm on very rocky ground here where I am in Texas. Uh, so I've got you know six, eight inches of soil and then I've got limestone underneath that. So even this basic builder grade slab, this is a production builder house from the 70s, you know, it's almost 50 years old, hasn't moved an inch, it's been solid. So I've got a great foundation. I did have a bunch of rot, a bunch of termite damage, but most of that's salvageable. Two by four walls, some walls were in perfect shape, others were ridiculous. By ripping off that sheathing and going new on the sheathing, and you can see I've got a section here of the house that, that I've had to pull out and reframe, um, we'll have basically new structure. The bones were in good shape, and the bones for me starts with a solid foundation. If your foundation's in bad shape, if you're on clay soil and experienced a lot of movement, that may be time for you to go, hey, I need to actually demo this house and start fresh. The foundation's good and most of the framing's good, you might have good bones and, and you can start uh, on a remodel versus, uh, versus demoing it. Now, what are the cons on new construction? Um, sometimes one of the big cons is, like I mentioned earlier, the lack of constraint. What you want can sometimes be really expensive. You know, I, I use this analogy a lot with people. I say, you know, if you go to the grocery store and say, hey, get whatever you want, uh, you might fill your cart full of expensive meats that are, you know, $20 a pound for steak. And how much is a shopping cart full of steak versus how much is a smaller basket, even if you put some steaks in there? So when we get everything we want, sometimes it's really beyond our means or we stretch too much or we have too big of a mortgage. And it's really hard to back down once you realize how much it costs. You know, whether you're like me and you have tons of experience and I was, I was thinking I was gonna spend X, but it's really X times X uh, on this project, or whether you've never built anything, it's really hard to back down once you've decided you want that. So it can mean that that process of designing that new house can be less than satisfying. Um, and no constraints almost always means a higher budget, no matter what you come into. Um, once you get everything you want, or you even try and back down but keep the things you really like, sometimes that budget's really higher on a new build versus a, a remodel. And the last thing is, when you build new, I tend to find that um, it's really hard to, to go light on square footage. And that's something I think that's uh, semi-uniquely American. 
uh, you know, we have a tendency to, to have lots of land here in America and, and build bigger and expect things at a lower cost. And I think that's, that's something we need to work on as an American society. You know, we can, we can do better with smaller. There's a uh, architect, Sarah Susanka, who has a, a, a bunch of books called The Not So Big House, um, where she basically, in a nutshell, advocates for smaller houses that are built better so that you can build a, a, a better project at your, at your budgets. And I'm a huge fan of that. And that's really what's happening here. This house uh, at under 3,000 square feet is gonna be affordable and doable for my family. I, I know this is more expensive than uh, a lot of Americans can afford. But uh, anyways, I really appreciate you guys hanging with me on this project. I wish you and your families a Merry Christmas. Um, stay tuned for 2020. We got a ton of stuff on the Build Show coming up. And if you haven't seen it, go check out my buildshownetwork.com. We've got three other fantastic builders, Wade and Jake and Brent in Fort Worth, who are publishing one video every single day to that website. Fantastic builders, different styles their version of the Build Show. So go to buildshownetwork.com. Guys, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show. Hey friends, this is an after the credits Christmas message from me to you. Um, many of you who have been following me for a long time know that I'm a believer in Jesus and I celebrate Christmas. Whatever you celebrate this year, I wish you guys happy holidays. But if you are like me and you follow Jesus, I wanna give you just one quick inspirational message of something that really hit me today as I was reading my Bible this morning and getting ready for this video. Uh, I was reading about when the angel Gabriel came and visited Mary. Uh, and if you, you probably have all heard the story, you know, the angel comes in, Mary's totally startled. startled. The angel says, hey Mary, you're blessed. Guess what? You're about to have a baby and it's gonna be God's son. And Mary's like, oh my gosh, I'm super, what are you talking about? You know, I'm a virgin, how is this possible? And this is, uh, this is Luke 1, start reading at verse 26, but I'm gonna pick it up here at verse 34. And Mary says to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. Elizabeth was barren, never had any kids. She's old, who knows how old, but she's old. And, and this is the sixth month with her who was to be called barren. Elizabeth was barren, no kids and older. And then this is what I want you to, to uh, think about. Verse 37, Luke 1, uh, 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it, to, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. A couple things on that. For nothing will be impossible with God. I don't know what you're facing this Christmas season. Not, it's not always a, a happy and a merry season. Uh, I've got a really good friend who's going through some hard times right now in his marriage. Um, and I want you to know that nothing is impossible with God. Pray and have faith. God can do it. And that's one thing that really separates us as a church, us as believers in Jesus from the rest of the world, from social clubs and moral people and all those things, is that the miraculous does happen. God does crazy, impossible things, and He can do that for you. And I love Mary's reaction to Mary basically says, let it be as you say, I have faith. You know, the angel basically said, you're pregnant, even though you're a virgin. All these other societal things were about to happen to her because she, she was engaged to Joseph to get married. And now she was gonna look like she was having a pregnancy out of wedlock. And yet she said, do it, Lord. I have faith in you. Guys, I wanna encourage you, have faith. No matter what's happening in your lives, no matter what tough times you're going through, read your Bible, have faith, and know that God does the impossible. Blessings to you, my friends. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's.